Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This is episode 110. Today's guest is a Native American activist, college professor, motivational speaker, and actress. You know her from many TV film roles over the past 30 years, including 500 Nations, Longmire, The Sopranos, and the critically acclaimed Reservation Dogs. And of course, she played Elaine's friend and Jerry's girlfriend, Winona, in the season five episode of Seinfeld, The Cigar Store Indian. Please welcome Kimberly Guerrero. Kimberly, thanks for joining. Hi, my pleasure. Good to see you all. Uh, this is such a treat, Kimberly. One of our favorites, um, obviously one of our favorite Jerry girlfriends, and of course, one of our favorite episodes. So take us back, I can't believe it, December of 93, The Cigar Store Indian aired on NBC. Right. How'd the role come about? I know you were fresh off As the World Turns and uh, Northern Exposure. You were really young in your career. Tell us a little bit about how, how the big show came about. Yeah, I had just um, graduated from UCLA and was just starting my acting career. And I got the call. It was a particularly busy time. Um, and I had just, you know, come off on a, like, as you mentioned, a couple other projects. And and so I think I had, I had a Walker, Texas Ranger audition, which I did not get on the same day. And it was so fun because other actresses, um, friends of mine that did not look like me <laughs> were going out, like they would go out on auditions like two or three times a day, you know? And I was like, what must that be like, you know, to get an audition after audition after audition. So it's the, I, I'll never forget that. It was the first time I ever got to do two auditions in one day. And I felt so cool. I feel like I'd arrived. Um, <laughs> and so I felt, I, I had the Walker audition first. So I felt a little bit like, my, it was like game on, you know, it was all warmed up. So when I walked into the Seinfeld audition, um, which was with the casting director, it, it just felt really natural. And, and um, also I'm really familiar with the character Winona. I mean, she's, you know, very much a just first world in the mix living in New York City. I just lived, you know, just moved back from New York City um, back to Los Angeles. And so you know, it just, she reminded me a lot of me and, and sort of, I kind of felt, I felt like I was playing much older than me at that point, you know, it's like mm. maybe somebody in their early thirties or something. So it was kind of an homage to, to my girlfriends who were journalists or were, you know, in these, um, you know, kind of positions of power and, and influence. And so, um, and I just felt like Winona was really, really mature. So I kind of picked a, a girlfriend of mine and modeled her after that girl and walked in. I felt just very secure about, you know, the humor that was there, I thought they did a great job writing that humor. Um, and and uh, it was just something that, you know, was embodied. It was like my embodied experience. So I felt really confident going in there and, and giving that that audition. Yeah, it's very cool. It's interesting you mentioned that you, you felt, you know, the character and you understood the, the humor that they had put into it. And we talk about a lot how great the writing is on Seinfeld and, and how good they are at navigating those sort of, you know, instances, whether it's the contest or uh, the outing where they talk about, you know, these kind of touchy subjects. And, uh, you know, this one could have been one of those two, but they handled it well. And it sounds like, you know, you thought so too. Um, it, we're interested, you know, was there anything in the script or anything where, you know, they wanted to make sure, cause you know, we talked to um, Danny Woodburn who played Mickey and uh, he mentioned the first time he was on there, the, the word uh, midget was in the script and he had to go to Larry David and just be like, you know, I have to say something here if the character says this to me. And they, you know, they talked it through and they gave him an extra line where he was able to say something to George. And he got that into the script to make sure that, you know, it was not OK to say that. Um, I'm just curious, if, you know, if that type of thing happened at all while you were on set or if there was any way they sort of, you know, had you your input involved in, in the script at all. As far yeah, as, you know, the wording there. Right. They were incredibly, um, the writers were there. Obviously, Larry was there. And they were incredibly um, thoughtful, you know, about <clears throat> approaching this. And they kept saying, is this too much? Is this too much? Are we <laughs> like, no, it's great. It's great. I think you can, because I, you could tell that the intention was from such a good place. And it was from a place of like edutainment, you know, um, it's like, yeah, let's think about these words that we say. And, and, and where they come from and how they might hit somebody else, you know, from that culture. And so there was, there was really a heart of respect and understanding um, there that, you know, comedy being the great equalizer, sometimes it can have that power, right? We can learn things that are maybe the deeper, deeper, harder truths about our past or our present. Um, and when we can laugh about them, we can, they kind of, kind of drops the guard. And so they were always really, really sensitive to that. I was just always saying, no, no, let's just go further. 
um, keep pushing it further. And, and uh, the one thing that I did ask, which was very kind of them, and probably because they were so cool about it, was that at the time, in particular, I was working on reservations with, with our Native youth, and they didn't really have a lot of role models back then to look up to. Um, meaning sports stars or folks on in film and television or in, you know, any of the arts or sciences or whatever. There just weren't a lot of Native people. They were out there, but they weren't getting necessarily the, you know, the, the mainstream coverage. Um, I think our Native people have always been out there, you know, doing extraordinary things, but we just didn't get the coverage. So it was important for me. I, I mean, at this point, I had been out working on the reservations for a few years and, and worked with thousands of, of kids. And I knew they'd be watching and so they had Jerry and I having a glass of wine. At that time, um, I was not drinking because I didn't, um, sobriety was such a big issue um, on our reservations. And I, so I was sober because I didn't want to like teach something I wasn't doing myself. And so they had us, Jerry and I drinking a glass of wine in that last scene. And I just asked, could it, could it be a bottle of Perrier or Pellegrino? Like obviously a bottle of sparkling water. And Jerry could be drinking his wine, but that I that went on his ass for this, this bottle of sparkling water. She's got sparkling water in her hand in a wine glass. And I'm like, of course. And it's like, you know, it's just those few kids that would have paid attention, you know, or that grandma or whatever. But I just thought that was so kind of them, you know, to make that adjustment. Wow. I mean, listen, 30 million people watched that night. So yeah, I mean, everything counts. So just going back to the, you mentioned the um, kind of the audition. I'm just curious, rumor has it that this Gamel and Pros originally it wasn't the cigar store Indian, it was the Moosehead. Did, were you familiar with that? Was like, when you came in, were you aware it was the cigar store Indian and like Winona was the, was the character? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Completely, completely aware and completely aware that that's, you know, that that's where they were going with it. So I didn't know about the moose head. Yeah. And I'm just so this, so you're, you, you're probably what, 26 or 25 years old when this came about. I mean, Seinfeld was in its fifth year, obviously, you know, one of the top shows growing um, on the network. So I'm just curious, like you were so young, like I, I have to imagine, were you a fan of the show? Were you nervous? Like take us a little bit kind of into your mindset as you kind of stepped on the set? Well, I knew, you know, I knew of it. I wasn't a, a, a huge of a fan at that point, but I'd watched a few episodes. I really loved it. Um, and and I wasn't nervous. I was just so happy to get to do comedy. I knew this was, I mean, it felt like for me as a Native person, like it's a once in a lifetime thing. And it was, I'm kind of like, put me in coach, you know, like I'm not just like, yeah. I'm up for the challenge. So part of the audition process, which was one of my favorite things of the whole, of this whole story was that when you get a call back, at least back then, um, and still today, sometimes now, of course we're on zoom, but you walk into the room and everybody's in the room. So if you get a call back, it's Jerry, it's Larry, it's, um, Tom and Max, the writers are there, the whole, all the producers, the director, and then the casting directors, they're reading with you or their, their assistant. So, you know, there were probably, if I'm guessing maybe like 15 to 20 men in the room. And I don't, I don't recall if there was, it was there was a woman there. There was certainly on set, but I don't know about in the room. And it was just like, <laughs> It's just so fun. I mean, to get to walk in there as Winona, and I just kind of walked in as Winona. She's like, what are you people doing? What do you want? It's, it's, it's just done, you know? And um, and so it was just, that's, I mean, I feel like from the get-go, I was kind of aware of where they were going with it. And, you know, kind of knew, like, I, I knew I could bring it. And so getting, like, having that confidence in the room and making them laugh. I mean, y'all, this is my... Northern Exposure was funny, but not funny like Seinfeld funny. <laughs> right. um, and so this was my first time getting to do, you know, I had done theater, you know, and done comedy and theater, but this is my first time to get to do a film television audition where I was getting to be funny. And I, comedy is my jam. And so it was just like, what a joy to walk into a room and make people laugh, make the writers laugh, make, make Larry David laugh. Um, and then it just continued on set, you know, just getting to make, like Jason was, um, Julie, Julie, Julia had just had a child. And so she wasn't really on the, the set very much, but to make Jason laugh. I mean, Jason would sit there and watch my scenes and, you know, or Larry, you know, making them laugh while we're rehearsing. It's like, oh, it's just like the greatest joy. Oh, that's great. And, and yeah, I mean, Jason, I don't think you were in any scenes with him, right? So he was watching. He was just, he, uh, yes, yeah, so they were just on set watching your scenes and laughing. That's, 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 uh, 
and That's, vice versa. Uh, yeah, I, I can imagine. Such a fun um, to sit there and watch people rehearse. You know, what what do you recall as 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 your um, you know, your memory on set? I know you mentioned you know Larry laughing and Jason laughing and the camaraderie. We've heard a lot about them. How you know we've talked to a lot of guest stars, and and it sounds like they're very open with guest stars and you know uh, michael richards especially is very you know fond of guest stars and they're you know they make them feel welcome and things like that i'm, I'm curious um you know you, most of your scenes were around with jerry but um was there anything in particular on set where you know you and jerry had this this chemistry where you know you can recall you know some sort of anecdote or things like that I yeah i mean the, honestly the whole time was just so much fun and i think i landed at a really um fortunate time for me as a as a guest star because because it was like because julia which was like right it was the core group because she was in in her trailer with her baby it was like i kind of got to be the girl you know i kind of got to be like the fourth wheel there for a while so it was like jerry myself jason and michael and larry like hanging out and they, they people have told you that right they hung out in the diner and they would riff, riff, riff and like come yeah. up with new like ideas for new. And they just sit around talking about nothing. Like, I wonder if you roll, do you roll the toilet paper from the top or the bottom? Do you like, you know, and going through all these different things. And so I got to hang out with them in the diner and I was absolutely included in all those conversations. So, you know, it, that was great. Um, Michael and I had a lot of really wonderful conversations. He was you know, telling me about his trip across country and stopping through Oklahoma and, um, and then Jerry and I were just chatting and at the time he was, he was, he was with his former girlfriend. And so we were having that chat about, he's like, so you are you in a relationship right now? I'm like, hang on. He's like, I'm in a relationship. Well, good for you. And he's like, what's the age gap between you and your, and your, your partner. And I'm like, mm, three years, two years. And he's like, mm, mine is, <laughs> <laughs> we know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so. Um, and so he, you know, we, we just, we talked about that, about relationships, we talked about basketball, um, talked about his cars. So it was wow. just, yeah, it was just really fun. And then I didn't really love Larry David. He, he would tease me because somehow he found out that I had been a teenage beauty queen, which is how I got my scholarship to UCLA. And I'm not a beauty queen. I'm like Sandra Bullock and Miss Congeniality. I like forced gut my way into this pageant and won the whole thing. And <laughs> Kind of fell in love with the girls on the on the way there and, and the, the whole process um but it was like how do i get to ucla from oklahoma it's like oh, i could i could enter one of those beauty pageants they give scholarships in the car <laughs> like my parents can't complain um and i ended up winning the, somehow he found out about that and then he was he would make me call him mr brooklyn he's like oh, okay miss miss dean america you can call me Mr. Brooklyn. So that's how I signed, <laughs> that's how I signed my script. Mr. Well, that's great. I mean, you know, Michael Richards from LA got the two New Yorkers and look at you from Southeast Oklahoma, like just fitting in like a glove. <laughs> um, so, I mean, so take that first scene. I just love that scene. You're at um, Elaine's apartment playing poker with, and we've had Peggy Lane and Lisa Pesce both on, on our show. They were playing poker with you. They're great. Right, um I just loved when kind of Jerry comes in and he says, hi, Winona. Like, I don't know, for some reason that line <laughs> I always gets me. Thank and, you, and you give that little smile. And then, I mean, just, yeah, tell us a little bit that that first scene and anything you remember about kind of the camaraderie with even some of the other guest stars. Yeah, you know, that was the thing. Camaraderie is a wonderful word because everybody there was so happy to be there. It was such a, a, a tight-knit um, group of people. And I mean, this was like in front of the camera, behind the camera, all the crew, we just all were having a lot of fun. And so it just, it took a lot of the nerves out of it. And um, it was also really fun. I mean, y'all keep in mind too, that at this point, and still to this point in my career, i pretty much only played Native American roles. And at that point, I think I'd only played, well, I just in Northern Exposure, which is I think my first contemporary, no, I, I've been in as a world term, but it just didn't feel, it felt like I just got to be a person. I wasn't necessarily, I mean, we're making the comedy about the Native American, but the thing is like, they didn't know, right? So I felt like I just got to be a person and hang out with the girls. And I just remember how much fun that was. And we would, you know, of course, in between, while they were doing the lighting setup or in between shots, we were just all having fun as girls, just having girl time, which was so, so, so great. Um, and it did feel like when Jerry came in, it was like an, kind of an interruption. There's like, 
<laughs> no, we're having fun here, like having fun in our card game. But then, I, you know, I did kind of have a crush. I mean, Winona kind of had a crush on him. She kind of thought he was cute. Um, so, you know, there, there was that little subtext in there. It was fun. You know, Kimberly, talking to you right now, you're so, uh, so just so much fun to talk to you and, and so personable and, and so much fun. And I, you know, I've been, I've been watching uh, Reservation Dogs and that character is a little bit different <laughs> than what you're showing us right now. Uh, it's, it's great though. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm assuming how you must be so proud of Reservation Dogs. You know, it's, it's in Oklahoma where you're from. And it's oh, yeah. obviously highlighting the Native Americans. Um, you know, I, wor I worked and lived in, in Glacier National Park next door to the, the Blackfeet Reservation um, for, for a couple of years. So I, I have, you know, seen that somewhat anyway and um you know i just want to maybe touch on you know that show and how proud you are probably of being on it. and you know it's obviously getting great reviews and everything yeah and actually my grandmother's reservation is steelish kootenai so i'm just on the other side of glacier park um oh, wow. flat lake is on our reservation yeah flat lake yeah yeah um but yeah we're just all so proud and i you know um i'm also on a wonderful show called rutherford falls as well and so to be on two comedies it's just such a, I mean, I've been waiting for so long. I mean, that's the whole thing, right? Like I haven't really gotten to do comedy since Seinfeld, like, you know, almost 30 years later. And so, and I didn't know, I didn't know if it was going to happen in my lifetime, but I certainly, you know, I was certainly working for it. Like I, I'll never forget. Um, it was, I believe it was Jerry's agent or manager was there on set. And he said, why, why are you only playing native roles? Like, why don't you play other roles? And I'm like, can you help me? Can you, <laughs> I mean, look at me. I'm literally one of the models for Pocahontas, <laughs> literally one of the models for Pocahontas. So it's like, I'm walking in like a live action figure. And, you know, as you can tell, my hair is really long and stuff like that. And there was just no breaking through that back then. So, but my, my, my goal was always show up on set prepared, be yourself. Um, people, you know, I love talking about our people and our culture. And so, you know, it was a really wonderful opportunity to let people know like, Hey, we're, we're alive. We're, we're, we're living in the real world. There's some great things going on out there. We have challenges too, as well that you may know about, but just always kind of advocating for our people on sets and showing people like, Oh, like native people are really cool. Maybe we should write another native character in here, you know? And so just really thinking about who's coming behind me, um, and making a way for them. And so to, I mean, I was telling you, I was working on reservations with native youth. And one of the things um, with my friends that I, I started with my husband too, was the Akatubi Film and Music Academy up on the Bishop Pite Reservation in California and Bishop, California. And our first, um, our graduating class, uh, there was a superstar that there were, they were all superstars, but one of our biggest superstars in that class was Tazba Chavez. We had maybe 13 students. Now Tazba's hiring me on Reservation Dogs and Rutherford Falls. And she's also a writer on um, Resident Alien. And so it's just it's just this incredible, you know, it, it feels like my creative kids are coming up now and like taking care of mama. <laughs> you know, That's wonderful. so it's just, it's just, such a, you know, walking on, I mean, Reservation Dogs is like, it's all family. Like my makeup artist is family. I mean, you know, it's just, and now my niece is on it, Natalie Standing Cloud. So, you know, it's just, it's just a joy. And I really like, I can't think about it too much when I go on res reservation dogs or whether it falls because like I'll tear up. I'm like, oh, I can't believe I'm here. It's like, oh, you got, you got a job to do. got to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, funny you are. And do you attribute that to your, to the Oklahoma upbringing? I mean, oh, yeah. there's a lot, so many funny people come from Oklahoma, clearly. Oh yeah. No, I mean, I, no, I would not be the same person. No, it's just, and, and even where I'm from in Southeastern Oklahoma, which is Auntie B is like straight up, like, you know, I'm bringing the Eastern Oklahoma, you know, Indian vibes to her. Yeah. It's just a lot of, a lot of really, you know, I grew up in what I fondly refer to as the ingrown hair follicle in the armpit of Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> Oklahomans would also agree with that, McCurtain County, it's like a kind of a scary place. So it's like this place where like kind of outlaws go and things like that. And it was just so fun. Like you just didn't know from day to day, also a little dangerous, but just such a fun, you know, place to grow up with just characters. And so I just kind of think I studied them growing up, you know? That's great. And, and speaking of characters, I know you lived in New York for a while. So uh, tying it back to kind of, uh, I felt like that Seinfeld episode was so New York, right? Like the subway scenes, the the, the gyro at, at Queensboro Plaza. I mean, it was a, you mentioned Jason kind of watching you. Like, what do you remember about like Frank and Estelle Costanza, Al Roker? Like it was a packed it was, episode. 
How did they do all that? And what is it you all know this? 23 minutes, 21 minutes? 22, yeah. 22 and a half and five storylines, I think. Because there was the coffee table book. There was the yeah. Indian. There was the girl coming to George's house. It was the TV guy guy. Yeah. yeah. TV guy guy. And our story. Yeah. And they all had that kind of equal airtime. And so it was just so much fun going from, you know, because it's obviously one big set and you have the different setups. So it's just like one power pack thing to another power pack thing to, oh my God, Frank and Estelle. I mean, just watching, oh, that scene when Jay, when they catch Jason and they're like, <laughs> who's, who's been, who's been, what'd she say? And I bet, who's yeah. been sleeping and I bet <laughs> we're going for, and you turn it into Bourbon Street. You know, it's just like, and then it was so crazy because you can't see it on television, but I was standing, I don't know, like it felt like six, seven feet away from Jason because I was just offset watching, you know, watching when he walks in and they, they confront him. I kid you not, beads of sweat popped out of his brow. And I know the television didn't ca catch it, but I was, I was just like, oh my God, he's a master. He's a master. But they are also, right, just so, just, um, just powerful, powerful comedians. I'm yeah. just like, psh, cracking it, cracking it, cracking it. And then Al Roker, what a sweet, sweet, we were all just kind of a bit, you know, like a flutter that, that Al Roker was there. I mean, what a sweet, sweet guy. Yeah. That, man, was, this, that was before he became like, Al Roker, like, you know what I mean? Like, I think he was just kind of starting on the Today Show then. Um, but yeah, what a, I mean, what an impactful episode, like all the way through. And literally like, but when people think about it, like Winona just like pops in our head. So like, it's a tribute to you. Aww. And I think our people, I think, I don't know. I still feel like, and maybe that's why Reservation Dogs is doing well. I still feel like people like, who, who are these Who are these people that were here before everybody showed up? And what are they doing now? Like, this is interesting. And so yeah. I, I do think, you know, Winona, and not, and not just because of me, I, I have several girlfriends who could have done a wonderful job as well, you know, but I do think she's a really special character at a very special time. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. I mean, and this was this was season five, the, the peak of the of the show. And for our money, it's probably the best season. Season three is really good, too. But season five is, is probably the best. Um, and, and like you said, at, at the right time, I mean, you know, according to Max Prost, from, from my understanding is um, the incident with the Chinese uh, um, post office uh, worker really happened to him. Uh, you know, he asked the post office guy where a Chinese wrestler was. He had to be Chinese and he yelled at him. That, that's the story I heard. Um, but I'm just like to your point of like, you know, the right time and, and how you mentioned earlier when you were talking about the script and, and how they handled it. Um, you know, in this day and age with with everyone, you know, it talk it's very touchy and you know, politically correct and things like that. It's just so refreshing to see, you know, them get it right and everyone in on the joke and understanding it. Like you said, what would you call it? Education through entertainment. Um, you know, it was, they're all professionals and, um, and really the show revolved around you like Moosehead, the Moosehead theme was going to be, I believe, you know, the, the, the woman was a, 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 an animal rights activist and she was offended by a Moosehead uh, as a present. And that was like the original idea, apparently. But I mean, to, 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 to switch to what it became, it just works so much better with, with, you know, Jerry and the tickets and everything that revolved around it and just how they handled it. And, and the way you go back at him, like, what were you going to say? And it's just like, he has to make sure, um, you know, what, what not to say. And um, maybe you could talk about just how much, how much fun just, just landing those jokes back and forth with, with a pro like Jerry is. Oh, that's, I mean, that's it. It's like Max and Tom, and that's the thing. It's like they had such, you know, they have such wonderful hearts and matched with their intellect and their comedic timing and their own kind of authenticity, right, of, of their lived experience. You know, they're just teeing up these jokes that are just like, you know, and I, I even knew back then, having not had a lot of experience under my belt at that point, I knew back then this is like, this is a once in a lifetime. And I wasn't afraid of it. It was just like, you know, you better knock this out of the park. And it's like, don't worry, I got it. I got it. I got this. And it's, it was easier too, because Winona was driving the scenes. It's a lot easier, I think, when you're driving the scenes. Um, and it was really fun to play, you know, the straight man to Jerry, you know? And, and so that was a real, that was a real joy and super, super, you know, he makes yeah. it so, so easy. It's interesting too, because he's usually the straight man to, to, to a Kramer or a George even, but in this, he was the one who was all riled up and didn't know what to do or what to say. And you were playing it straight. That's a really good point. I mean, it, it's very, not very often where he was um, uncomfortable in the show. 
Jerry is usually very comfortable. Everything now that's a shame rubs off his back and just goes along. He's even Steven, but in this episode, um, you know, he was on edge and that was because of you, your beauty, your, your charisma, the way you, you, you know, you, you handled him. You pretty much had him wrapped around your finger at that point by the end, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was another thing is that I think it's also really great to get to be a Seinfeld girl that didn't have something like that Jerry disliked about her. So I think there was, I mean, and again, it's like, y'all don't understand like what a big deal this was, not just for for me as a person, it's like for us as a community, like to get right, you know, to get put on this kind of pedestal and then get to like, you know, throw blows and then down goes Frasia, you know, it's like she wins, <laughs> right? She doesn't like <laughs> love, love the sports references. So speaking of that, speaking of sports references, I know your mom was kind of integral, um, obviously in your life. I know she meant a lot to you and she had a big uh, presence on Oklahoma State. So you're you're a you're a cowboy girl. I know you became a Bruin, but um, co you, college football is your your jam, right? No, yeah, in English Premier League. Really? Yeah. So what? Barry Sanders. Who's your guy from Oklahoma State? Barry, probably Barry. Yeah, is, is my generation. Uh, Thurman Thomas. Oh yeah. But then when I grew up as a kid, Reuben Gant, who played for the Bills for many years, he was my babysitter. He and his wife. And so, oh, wow. um, yeah, it was just, that's how I became a, a Bills fan. Really? Um, I still am. But yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, it was just a really beautiful, uh, it was a beautiful way to grow up. And then ironically, I married um, Johnny Guerrero, whose brother is Danny Guerrero, who's just le left the athletic directorship at UCLA. So he was athletic director there for, I don't know how many years. And I was a pom-pom girl at UCLA. So it was a really yeah. fun, I kind of just kind of went from oh, you know, wow. as a, you know, Oklahoma State to a Bruin, then to, to get to be in that that level, you know, that kind of access to, to the Bruins was really So cool. he took, uh, uh, yeah, he had Troy Aikman, Reggie Miller. So were you, were those your guy? like, were those, were you cheering for those guys back then? Yes. So I, yes, the Troy and, and Reggie. Yep. Yep. Wow. Buffalo <laughs> Bills, huh? All right. Well, yeah, Thurman oh, Thomas. Brother. Thurman Thomas, yeah. Troy was from um, Oklahoma, and our his football coach was was my – I mean, we were really good friends with the commodities, which was a really cool um, connection as well. So that was really – I mean, I turned around and talked to Troy in one, in one English class. And he was like, oh, here, here's another girl probably trying to hit on me. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, I'm from Idaho. <laughs> what? I'm like, yeah, I know the commodities. <laughs> so, yeah, he was a great guy. Wow, small world. And so Seinfeld and, you know, we'd be remiss, another huge kind of New York, uh, New Jersey show was The Sopranos. I mean, I know you had a small role on that, but what can you tell us kind of about similarities, if you will, between the two shows and kind of some of like Larry David versus David Chase? Um, anything pop? Yeah, I mean, it, it's what does pop for me because it was such a small role was that the and granted, keep in mind, Seinfeld, of course, um, shot at, was it CBS? Yeah, um, Bradford. Bradford um, in LA. But it did have a, it didn't have a New York feel to it. And then when I went to Sopranos, I'm thinking, you know, I did end up getting cast on Walker, Texas Ranger. And I'm thinking, you know, that's going to be a very warm cast. And they were okay. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, just wasn't as kind of warm. But you walked onto Sopranos, Edie Falco stopped and said, hello, hi, I'm Edie, welcome to the set. You know, what's your name? I'm like, I'm a day player, but hello, my name's wow. Kimberly. You know, I didn't say that. I was just like, oh, hi, I'm Kimberly. And and so, and David Strait there and was there and we were on my very first movie, Son of the Morning Star. So we got to talk and catch up. Um, but there was just such a love, same kind of vibe it's on the Seinfeld set. There's such a love and camaraderie and such a um, an equitable place, right? So there was no like, oh, you're craft service and you're a grip and, you know, I'm a I'm the talent and whatever. It was like really democratized. And everybody, there was a lot of love, you know, for everybody on that set. Um, and it was so, and it was just, yeah, it was, it was a very, you know, it was, both just like such a such wonderful warm sets i would say that's the most in common that they had yeah and it's interesting too because we were talking about how well the seinfeld handled the topics and, and that sort of thing and you know soprano is a completely different show right they're, they're handling the topic a little bit differently with their by by showing their ignorance it, uh, it actually helped you know show show that side of it whereas seinfeld used used humor around sort of the jokes and things like that so i just found that you know, completely different ways to kind of handle that topic. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. 
it was it was really fun. Um, you know, Peter Bogdanovich directed that episode, and um, and Steve Buscemi was in that scene. Uh, Michael Imperioli and Polly Walnuts, like the whole you know that whole kind of crew, and some of the guys, some of the wise guys, were in there like joking around about Na- what about Native Americans and these effing casinos and blah blah blah. And Steve Buscemi and Michael Imperioli are like guys guys i mean because they were like going right they're going right and finally they're like i think it was steve buscemi is just like or michael imperially one of us i was like guys i think our dealer here is actually native american so it was like the seinfeld episode in real life they're like what f me oh my god i'm so <laughs> sorry oh my god you gotta have lunch with us today and they were like telling me like uh, telling me all the names that i could call them as a child, folks, <laughs> growing up and I had the most fun at lunch that day because I got to hang out with all of them and they got like got to they basically got to be Jerry that day and like got to like make up to me like how <laughs> all oh, the offensive great. things they had said but it was I mean it was just such a it was just such a great again just a really great warm you know cast and crew to be around that's great to hear um you know so Winona I mean when I think about it, like Seinfeld's such a popular show and we're doing a podcast about it 30 years later um as the world turns it's kind of another cultish show if you will i'm just curious like what are you what are you most recognized for all these years later do people i I know they're kind of different audiences but like do people come up to you about winona as the world turns or you know a lot of the current work you're doing seinfeld winona for sure i've had people actually come up on the street and want to do like play out the scenes with me yeah and a lot of times they won't give me any like they'll just come up and they'll start saying the lines and i'll start saying them right back to them or you know they'll stop in in the most random places too our whole family was out um, on an alaska cruise and in the middle of ketchikan alaska and like a little tourist traps a guy completely like freaks out and his wife was like they're a young couple and she's like I'm sorry, like we're, we're on a honeymoon, but my husband just is a huge Seinfeld fan. Could you just, I don't know if he wanted, to give me, he wanted me to give him a line or something like that. So I think that's, you know, usually the most recognized um, role that I've played. And I would say second most is probably maybe Longmire. And of course now Reservation Dogs. Yeah. yeah and he's kind of taken over. It's funny. That's the second time a guest star has mentioned that to us on an Alaskan cruise. Someone came up to them about Seinfeld. Don McManus, who played, um, Don. you know, Don, yeah, you know, Don in the race, someone came up to him, did the same thing. But shortly after we, maybe a year after we did this episode, my wife and I went on a uh, cruise, the one and only cruise we've ever been on, up through the, uh, the interior passage in Alaska. And we're in, uh, you know, going through the buffet lines and all the rest of it. And she and I kept hearing people calling out, Hey, Duncan! Hey, Duncan! <laughs> like, who the... Who, who, I, I, did they think I'm someone else? And finally they were like, You're Duncan Meyer! And I was like, <laughs> Oh! Oh, that's... And the penny, penny finally dropped, but it was... Yeah. So, there you go. So, and another... another uh, uh, Oklahoma and you work with a lot. Uh, Tracy Letts, I know you do a lot of work with him. He was also on Seinfeld. Like, so I feel like you have a bunch of any other Seinfeld connections we should know about, or is what Tracy the only one? I've never thought about that. There have to be. There have to be because everybody was on there. I would have to do some research. I'm sure there are. But yes, of course, Tracy, when I was doing um, when I was doing August Osage County, you know, that was a that was a pretty big deal. It was like, you know, that we've both been on Seinfeld and um, you know, talked about our shows and things like that. So, yeah, I'm not gonna think about that. I'm sure there are. Yeah, like I Dawn, I thought about that. Don and I did a, a pilot for NBC together um, and got to be friends that way. Yeah, Bill Burr is in, in an episode of Reservation Dogs, but I don't think he was in when you were in, so I'm not sure if you crossed paths with him. I know he was in he was in one episode. He wasn't on Seinfeld, but he's comedian and been on Comedians Cars or Coffee and that sort of thing. But right. Um, I think I might be I'm in and I think I might be in an episode with him this year. Oh, we'll season see. two? It's 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 uh shooting? Yeah. We're, oh yeah. cool, yeah. We're Looking forward to that for sure. It's it's such a it's such a show that, you know, it's I just love new, unique. I mean, take it by the sign when Seinfeld came out, it was like there's nothing like this, right? I mean, there's not there's nothing like when Seinfeld first came out, it was like 
before it, there was nothing like it. After it, everything's tried, right? And now this show that you're in now, there's been nothing like it. Like you can't compare it to anything. So it's always great to see a new groundbreaking show like that. Yep. It's it's so true. And it's it's really hard because I'm a screenwriter as well. And I've got a show right now um, that that's, you know, getting close to hopefully being greenlit. And it's so hard to describe the tone. It's like, duh, it's, it's, you know, it's like, it's the res. I don't, it's so hard to explain. Right, right. You know, it's <sighs> not. It's nothing like Reservation Dog, so I don't like to use that as a comparable. But I'm starting to like have to. It's like just watch that, and how are you gonna how are you gonna pitch that show? Right, right. You know? um, so it's like this show is kind of it's it just the res is the res. So I'm saying it's uniquely indigenous. <laughs> That's my tone. It's uniquely <laughs> indigenous. Just yeah. whenever you're pitching it, just say hey, it's a show about nothing, and then uh, there you go. It will, it will take <laughs> off. It's about nothing on the res. But uh, Kimberly, this has been a treat. We uh, we can't thank you enough for spending some time with us tonight. I mean, just the way you're giving back to the community and the teaching you're doing, all the writing, um, you're just you're an inspiration. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Tony. Thank, enjoy. You, Kimberly. thank you for being patient with me on this. <laughs> we, got uh, it. we got it done. No problem. Thanks so much, Kimberly. Thank you. All right. Take care, y'all. Good night. Bye.